sanctify me. Lord of the heavens, please sanctify me. To be pure and holy, set apart for thee. To be pure and holy, set apart for thee. My risen Savior, come baptize me. Good evening, church. As you know, today we were unable to meet at the church in person. We were unable to go ourselves to the building as the roads were not permitting us. We are getting the um, parking lot plowed as we speak, so we will be here on Wednesday meeting in person. So stay warm, and hopefully you can stay indoors as much as you can and be safe. And uh, we will see you again very soon. But tonight, enjoy a message from the um, Prescott Church with Pastor Mitchell. He's going to be preaching tonight for us. And so, God bless you. And we'll see you again very soon, Wednesday evening. And thank you, musicians and workers. Good evening. Very good to be with you. Again, as Stephen said, we were in London and just great to see the, the growth over time of the churches there. Numbers of churches, or many of them are planting churches, and, and uh, some of them multiples. I think they had three different churches that will now be uh, having their own harvesters homecoming. That's when they have planted out a number of workers, and they bring them home to uh, let them preach, let the people see the investment they're doing and so just fantastic to see what God is is doing in the UK. Thank God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalm 77, chapter 77. Have a uh, photo they're going to put up in the beginning here. This is not in sand, this is in stone. In October 22 uh, of 2022, archaeologists found these footprints preserved, embedded into uh, the ground as now hardened stone. Those had been hidden underwater for many years, but then because of the change in the coastline, they found these footprints. These are ancient footprints. The footprints were always there, but they were covered by the ocean, and so only in 2022 could they be seen. I use that by way of illustration. The text that we're going to read, it speaks about the footprints of God. And the footprints of God are in the waters, is what our text says. So this is actually teaching us some lessons, talking about God's power and help in the midst of trouble. So I wanna preach about the footprints of God. Psalm 77, reading at, starting at verse 16, the Bible says, The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you, and they were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, or your path was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron, the footprints of God. I want to begin, let's talk about prayers in distress. This psalm is a prayer. It literally is someone writing down what they're going through and they are talking to God. Now, there are different kinds of prayers. You understand in the Bible, there are daily prayers. We had morning prayer this morning as we do each day during the week. Morning prayer, this is regular and consistent. Daily prayer is not dependent on circumstances. We're not there because everybody was 
facing arrest or death or divorce or some crisis financially. Psalm 5.3, my voice, you'll hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I'll direct it to you and I will look up. Daily prayer is about having relationship with God. You open yourself to God daily. Daily prayer is doing kingdom business. Matthew 6.10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is in the daily prayers of life. We make requests. We're asking God to establish his kingdom, literally rule in our lives, rule in our cities, in our church, in our families. And then, of course, daily prayers are about guidance. Lead me, guide me, help me in different ways. The prayer that we just read is not a daily prayer. This is what they call a psalm of distress or a prayer of distress. The reason why he was praying this prayer is not because it's seven in the morning or whatever time people choose to pray. Things are going wrong and it drives him to pray. Psalm 77 verse one through three, this is before we started reading, says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me when I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. Verse 2, in the New King James, it says, in the day of my trouble, in the NIV, in my distress. Now, the writer of the psalm here, we don't know why he was in distress, because distress can be very personal. What may be distressing to you might not be to another person. It is very personal. One person, it's health. There's a crisis of health. Some of you are facing a health crisis right now. You are in distress. Others, it is unsaved. Family members, that is what's causing your distress. Others, it's your marriage. Right now, you are in marriage trouble, and that is causing your distress. And still others, it's financial situations, or maybe it's factors that are involved in the church. But whatever the reason was for him to be in distress, the psalmist is being honest, and he's talking about the effect that trouble can have on our hearts. Verse two, trouble and distress. Those are the two words that are used. It, it literally is anguish and vexation. It's the idea of being pressured. I have problems and they are squeezing me. That's how it feels. We make sayings like, I feel like my head is in a vice. I thought my head was gonna explode. My brains feel like scrambled eggs. Those are just modern ways of saying what he says because of what's going on in my life. It, it is distressing to me. You know what? When you're facing trouble of whatever kind in your life, it's not merely information, is it? It's not merely facts. It's, it's not like, mm hmm, so I have three months to live. I see. Well, it is not information, it is emotional. Verse 3, he says, I was, I feel overwhelmed. It, it's a picture of drowning. I have so much trouble. All at the same time, I feel like I'm going under. And what happens to people when they are in distress? Troubles bring questions. Or troubles make you question things. Trouble can make you question God. Psalm 77, this same psalm that we read, verse 7 through 9, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased or stopped forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? This man is writing because of trouble. He says, wait, wait a minute. Where is God? I don't, I don't get it. I'm going through hell. Where is the God of heaven? 
We can question God's love. Verse 9, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? There are people, some of you maybe, that what you're going through, you're going through trouble, and the devil says it's because of what you have done wrong. That is why God is in heaven going, good, I'm glad you're in trouble. You deserve it after what you've done. That's what trouble does. Is, is, this, is God paying me back? We question his love. Mark 4, 38, Jesus was in the stern of the boat asleep. The disciples woke him and said, don't you care if we drown? We can question God's power. Maybe what I'm going through right now is, is too big. Maybe, maybe for normal circumstances, God said, I can help you with that. But man, God just looks and says, this is, this is, this is too much. The New English Bible says in verse 10, has God's right hand lost its grip? So trouble can make you question God. Trouble will make you question yourself. This is what happens to people. When life is smooth, they think, you know what? I think I can make it. I can do this. What God wants me to do, I think I can do it. But trouble comes. And now all of a sudden we start doubting. It's not God we doubt. God's a miracle worker. It's me. I don't think I can make it. It was Elijah in the cave after Jezebel threatened his life. He's in the cave and he says, look, God, there's no point in going on. Clearly, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I might as well die. God can use other people. God can help other people. They can handle it. I just don't think that I can handle it. One of the classic strategies of hell is that the devil brings trouble and then because there is trouble often that he brought in the first place, he makes Christians feel guilty. They have a false guilt because they're coming to church. They see other people, look at them smiling. I don't feel like smiling. I must be a terrible Christian because right now I feel like this guy in the psalm. I feel like I'm being squeezed. So you start questioning yourself. And then some people, it makes you question leadership. Exodus 17, 3, the people were thirsty for water. They grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt? Make us and our children, our livestock die of thirst. This is what happens sometimes to people when they are in trouble. They start looking for someone to blame. First Samuel 30, verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. I've heard people that they say, you know what, if the pastor preached better, I wouldn't have these problems. If I had gotten better counseling, then we wouldn't be in this mess today. So these are all reactions when people are in distress, like our, our psalm says. The real issue for the writer of the, of the psalm here, it's not that he is in trouble because everybody will be in trouble at one point or another. The issue is simply he couldn't see God where is God in the midst of all my trouble? Let's talk secondly about the footsteps of God. Our text makes a statement and says, God is in the storm. Verse 16, the waters saw you. Those same waters, he's describing this. The waters of trouble that I feel like I'm drowning there making me go under with all the trouble, he says, God, the waters saw you. This is a different perspective. The beginning here, he's doubting God's presence based on the trouble. That's what we read before. Where is God? If I'm going through hell, where's the God of heaven? And why is he doubting? Because of trouble. 
But the Bible is telling in this text, God is with us even in the midst of trouble. You know, it's very dangerous to form a theology or your view of God based on your circumstances. There are people that say, Jesus is alive. How do you know? Because I got a check in the mail today, a pay raise and a promotion. Jesus is alive. But what happens if you get sick? You lose your job, crash the car. Is Jesus not alive? See, that, that's, it's very dangerous to have circumstances determine what you believe. Isn't this what happens? Have you ever witnessed to someone, ask them if they believe in God and they say, I used to until someone died, a tragedy happened. So they're basing their view of God on circumstances. It was Mary after Jesus was crucified and buried in the tomb, the Bible says she came on Easter morning. She's going to come because they had to hurry. They hadn't been able to properly prepare Jesus' dead body and embalm him properly. And so she comes to the tomb and she meets Jesus who is now risen from the dead but the Bible says she thought he was the gardener. In other words, she couldn't identify Jesus. Her tears, her distress, her trouble had blinded her from seeing God who was right in front of her. The disciples were in a boat in the middle of the, a great storm. Matthew 14, 26, Jesus went to them walking on the lake when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. So the Bible says God is with us in trouble. He's with us in the storm. The problem is that God's presence in the storm is often hidden. He's with us, but he can be difficult to see. Psalm 77, 19 your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. On sand, you can see. Wet sand, like that. Be easy. If the footprints of God look like that, it's like, oh, God is here. On the grass, in the dirt, you can see, but our text says God's footsteps are in the water. Not so easy to see, even though he is there. He is stepping, but because it's the water, I can't see. Where is he stepping? What is he doing? So this is the common problem. We question is God here? Is he doing anything about the problems in our lives? See, God's work in the storm is often hidden. It looks like God is doing nothing simply because we can't see it. Think about Joseph. Joseph went through nine years of slavery and imprisonment. He was, and his brothers sold him as a slave. He lived as a slave, then he's lied about. He's in prison. He went through this for nine years. When you were free and now you're sold into slavery, you'd be wondering, where is God, right? You're in prison, <laughs> where is God? Because the obvious is if God was here, what am I doing in prison? Why am I a slave? But the perspective that Psalm 105, 17 says, God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. So the Bible says, Joseph couldn't see it at the time, but in fact, God knowing that his brothers would sell him into slavery because of their own envy, God began to work actually to prepare a way that later on in a famine, all the Jewish people could be saved. 
The book of Esther is such a, a fantastic book. And in the book of Esther, it is a fascinating book of the Bible. It's the only book of the Bible where the name of God is never mentioned one time. Did you know that? It's the only book of the Bible you won't find. You know, most books of the Bible have multiple names of God and God's name is all through it. The book of Esther, not one time do you see God's name ever mentioned. And yet, you can see God at work. The plot against the Jews, it looks as though God had abandoned them. This wicked man, Haman. Hatred of Jews, anti-Semitism is not new. That didn't arise in 2023, 2024. It's, it's been there. This man cooked up a plot on a certain day. He tricked the king into signing into a law that it was legal to kill the Jewish people. But you see, God was already at work. His name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, but you see, God was already working a way to overcome the strategies of hell. A queen was removed from being a queen. The king needs a new queen, so he has kind of a beauty contest. And then out of all of the young ladies in the kingdom, he happens to choose Esther the Jew. A Jew is married to the king who had been tricked to sign into law a plot to kill the Jews, an assassination plot. Her uncle works at the court, in the front of the court of the king, and happened to overhear two men plotting to kill the king and reported it, and that was forgotten for a time. The king has insomnia. One night, I can't sleep. Bring me the boring daily court record, literally. 10.32 a.m., a guy came to talk about his taxes. 10.47, a guy, you know, on and on and on. And he comes across the record of the assassination plot. And he said, what did we ever do for that guy? And they said, we didn't do anything. And out of that, deliverance comes. So this is what happens. Many times in life, suddenly, we see God working. But it's not like he just started now. It's not like God woke up from a nap and said, oh, man, I better do something. He was in the sea. He was working, but it just couldn't be identified. Our text says God makes a way in the midst of trouble. Psalm 77, 19, your path led through the sea, your way through the, the mighty waters. This is referring to when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea. So how would you like to be with these people here? God does this miracle, the walls of the water parts and form, it would be like forming walls. And then Moses says, it's okay, walk through it. How would you like that? You see the water that at any time could come crashing back. The Bible said they go through on dry ground. Not even, they didn't get mud on their feet. God made a way that God can do that. That is what happens. Sometimes God will make a pathway through trouble for it to be resolved. But there's a responsibility in the midst of trouble. So this is an honest psalm. Many of the psalms, I love them because they're so honest. They often begin with telling what, what's going on in their head and their heart that might not be good. But then he gets to the personal responsibility what should we do when we are in trouble? When we're the ones who feel like we're drowning, when we're the ones that feel like our brains are being squeezed. Because in our text, he shows us what every person has to do for themselves. And that is, number one, we must rehearse God's past works. In the Bible, Psalm 77, 5, 6, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times I call to remembrance. My song in the night I meditate within my heart. My spirit makes diligent search. 
He says, I am thinking of what God has done in the past. Psalm 77, 10 through 12, I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I'll remember the works of the Lord. Remember your wonders of old, and I'll meditate on all your work and talk of all your deeds. Verse 14 and 15, you are the God who does wonders. You've declared your strength among the peoples. With your arm, you redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. He says, this is what you should do when you are going through trouble. This is why Christians should read their Bibles. Because the Bible is a record of God working in people's lives. Working his will in people's lives. When you read in the Bible, you will find people who are going probably through things that you're going through right now. And you can see God made a way. God helped them. You have to rehearse that. I can't see God at work right now, but I certainly in the Bible can see God at work and identify what he did in the past. You have to, secondly, rehearse God's work for you personally in the past. Now, this is not just what you find in the Bible. What has God done for you? God saved you miraculously, delivered you, healed your body, provided, guided, gave favor to people, provided solutions. That is a powerful thing. There are times in life where, where uh, uh, Lisa and I, we are facing trouble and I'm I am thinking about in this situation, how is this one going to work out? But I am married to a good woman, and she will say, Greg, did God help us in the past? It's like, yes. <laughs> remember, when God, and remember when we felt like we didn't know how it was going to work out, but God did it. Th that's right. Yes, God is going to help just like he did it. You know what God's help is? transferable. The reason why you need to mentally and vocally rehearse what God has done for you in the past, because you can transfer miracles of any kind into new situations. David said, God helped me with a lion and a bear, therefore he's going to help me with a giant. If you can look back in your life and point to any point in time when God helped you, then you can use that as a springboard saying, then God can help me in this area today. And then thirdly, you want to make it through your trouble, you need to say it out loud to other people. Verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Derek Kidner, the commentator, said this is a public remembrance. I will make mention of is a public recounting of these deeds. You know what? There's something powerful about telling someone, God is going to help me. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know how. You don't have to work out details and timing. But there's something powerful about when you're struggling to say to someone, listen, God is going to help me. I don't know how, but I believe that God is going to help me. Listen to this. Uh, Matthew uh, Yorakwai lost his footing on an icy trail, and he, he began to slide. Both he and his friends started sliding down. They slid 150 down from Ice House, uh, 150 feet down from Ice House Saddle. This is near Mount Baldy in California. Both of them, their cell phones fell out of their pockets during the slide. Uruguay slammed into a tree and was badly injured, but because they lost their cell phones on the long slide down the mountain, Neither of them had a way to call for help. Iroquois is injured. He grabbed a stick and he's going to try to take a step. And when he jabbed in the snow with a stick, it hit something. He dug the snow away. It was a cell phone that another hiker who slid down in exactly the same way three days before had lost their cell phone and didn't have a lock on the screen, it had 1% battery left. And Matthew Uruguay was able to call 911, and they were able to be rescued. His friend said hitting that spot was like one in a billion. On a whole mountain, a frozen phone in the middle of the hill, and the sheriff's department was able to rescue both 
hikers. You know what? What they did, they got the phone and they spoke it out loud. That's what our text says. There's something. When you're going through hell, speak it out. God helped them in the Bible. God has helped me. I'm telling you, God is going to help. Final thought our text brings out, and that's the blessing of leadership. Our text says God walks in the water, but he says God works through leadership. Verse 20, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. So it's almost strange. It's like God, God moves in the, he made a way in the water. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about Moses and Aaron. It's like, what do they have to do with this? Do you know that God's gift to you in trouble and in the storm is leadership. Men of God that are there to help you. Do you know you're not meant to fight your battles on your own? Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be held up. Exodus 17, verse 11, there's a battle. God's people are in the valley. They're fighting enemies that are trying to destroy them. And the Bible says that Moses on the top of the mountain was lifting up his hands in prayer, holding the, the staff, the rod of authority. This is a picture of prayer. And the Bible says, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. There's a partnership here. God's gift to the people who are going through hell in the valley is a man of God who is praying for them he had something to do with God helping them. They had a part. He had a part. Together, the battle was won. There's something about this. When you have a, a connection to a godly, uh, a man of God, there's something supernatural. I, men have mentioned this to me. I, I think maybe Jesse uh, said something like this in a sermon a while back. Is that I get... I get calls from pastors in distress. They call me. They are, they're freaking out about problems in the church, about crisis with people, situations they've never faced, financial crisis. And sometimes they, they have remarked later on is that I called Pastor Greg and I was freaking out, but Pastor Greg seemed so calm. And they said, that, that helped me knowing that he... He didn't go, oh my God, what? it's terrible. What are we going to do? Right? Brought, brought reassurance to them. Any of you future disciples, there's a lesson there. If you ever fly, you ever notice that? Pilots never have high squeaky voices. <laughs> We're going to fly. <laughs> anyway, I digress. <laughs> You know, in the military, the ranks, uh, uh, the symbols of rank in the different ranks, in the, in the U.S. military, they're based often on viewpoints, a fence, a tree, eagles, stars, because each of those have a higher viewpoint, something that the soldier on the ground might not be able to see sometimes leadership can provide direction. 2 Samuel 5, 23 through 25, David inquired of the Lord. He answered, don't go straight up, but circle around behind them, attack in front of the balsam trees. When you hear the sound of marching and the, sound, and the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly because the Lord is fighting for you. That's sometimes what direction can be brought. Maybe this is something that you could do sometimes there's spiritual support that leadership can provide i've had people say when we agreed in prayer something lifted off of me sometimes leadership can provide comfort there are, some of you have come to me and you're going through hell and i've been honest with you i can't give you an easy answer i can't snap my finger but i promise you it's not always going to be like this because i have seen again and again i've seen god help 
If God's gift to help you in trouble is leadership, the devil wants to do everything he can to separate you from leadership. Matthew 26, 31, smite the shepherd and the flock will scatter. People who don't go to church, people who rarely go to church or miss lots of church, they're in trouble. When they're in distress, like in this psalm, they're trying to fight on their own. Those who are independent, those who are rebellious, are in trouble. The animals in the herds that are separated are the ones that often are the, in the biggest danger. So our text is describing a partnership. God is at work. We have a personal responsibility. And then if you have godly leadership, they can help you make it through. Think about two different perspectives on help. 2009 in the, in the Battle of Kamdesh. This was a, an American combat outpost in Afghanistan. 300 Taliban assaulted the outpost with mortars, grenades, and snipers. American soldiers were outnumbered 10 to 1. The Taliban made it into the outpost after 48 minutes of battle. By the afternoon, the Americans were almost defeated, but they called for help. Apache uh, helicopters and 19 different fighter jets came and brought airstrikes. The soldiers on the ground said it turned the battle. There are times when you will see, you'll be like the writer of the psalm right now, I'm going through hell, but God can in a moment. Suddenly something lifts. Suddenly things begin to change. That is one way that you say his footsteps I didn't see it, but God was there ready to help me. But the other way God's footsteps are only seen after the fact. Think about American history, April 30, 1776. Soldiers under the command of George Washington were trapped in Brooklyn, New York. They were being shelled by British Navy ships and they were about to be surrounded. So George Washington ordered them to evacuate all 9,000 men and their equipment, including wagons, by boat. Soon as night fell, they started loading everything they had into the boats and making crossing after crossing. You know, the famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. That's, uh, but of course, it was pitch dark in actual fact. By the... As the sun started to come up, they still had a whole lot of men and equipment to get across. And as soon as the British see them, they're going to be in great danger. But at that moment, a thick fog descended. They said it was impossible to see more than six feet. Even when the sun came up, the fog was so dense, but it was only dense on the New Jersey side, in New York, where they wanted to be, it was crystal clear. And the fog stayed blocking the sight of the British until the last American soldier, and as soon as the last boat reached the New York side, the fog lifted, and the British soldiers were amazed to see the Americans on the other side waving at them. See, this is the other way. You're looking, you're in the middle of the darkness. I have no idea. It's after you get over, it's like, that was a miracle. That's exactly right. Because the Bible says God's footprints are in the sea. And that's telling us of his work in the midst of our troubles. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes, if you would, just for a moment. Thank God. With our heads bowed, if you're here tonight, I want to give you a challenge. First of all, if you're not right with God, it's to you I want to speak first of all. There are some of you here, you are in trouble, but the problem is you don't have God on your side because you're living in sin. The Bible says God will not bless sin. You can't live like a devil and then say, God, I got a problem. Come down and fix it quick. What you need to do is Fix that sin problem, that rebellion against God, living your own way. 
breaking God's commands. You need to fix that. There's a way you can fix it. Jesus died on the cross and paid with his blood for you to go free. If you're here tonight and you're not right with God, I want to give you a challenge. If you'll pray with an honest heart, God can make himself real to you. He can begin to change you from the inside out. How many people here, you are not right with God. You want to pray tonight and have God forgive you. If that's what you want to do, lift up your hand so I can see it. You say, Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. Lift your hand right now. God loves you. He wants to help you. If you're not right with God, lift your hand right now. I want to have someone pray with you and help you to begin the miracle of salvation. Lift your hand. God loves you. He wants to help you. Some of you are backslidden. Maybe it was that trouble messed with your head and you turned your back on God. Backslider, lift up your hand. You say, I want to come back. I want to get right with God tonight. God can help you. Thank God. I want you all to stand up to your feet. I'm going to open the altars. Some of you are going through trouble right now, just like this psalmist. Why don't you come? To tell God, I need help. In the midst of trouble, I need you. I'm doubting you, doubting myself, whatever it might be. Doubting headship. God, I want to trust you. But I need you to help me in my heart so that I can make it through this trouble. They're going to sing while people are coming to pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power. Satisfy my needs. Only you can make me whole. Give me strength to help me grow. Come, Come Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me. Come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power. Satisfy my on me come Holy Spirit fall afresh on me fill me with your power satisfy my need only Sing it again, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fill me with your power, satisfy my need. Amen. I want to help you to pray. There are people, how many of you, you'd, you'd say, I am like this psalm. I've been going through distress, whatever flavor or kind. Lift up your hands. I've been going through distress. I need God to help me in my mind, in my heart. I want you, if you'll just lift up your hands towards heaven, I'm going to lead you in a prayer and then I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to help you right now. I want you to say, Father God, I am your child and I am in distress. 
you see what I'm going through. I need you to help me in my heart, in my mind. Help me to trust you. I choose to trust you. You love me. You are at work. You're going to help me. You're going to bring me through. And I thank you in advance for the answer and the miracle that I can't see right now. But I know you're going to help me. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God together right now. Father God, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you for the victory of the cross. God, I thank you for your love and your power, Lord God. God, you are good to us. Praise God. Praise God. Thank God.